this is uh, a new book, just released. And so what we're going to do is kind of talk about the subject matter of the book in the context of the book itself. So you see it'll be two things, talking about the book, but also the real ideas that lie within it. So what is this book? Comprehensive <laughs> Survey of Methods Used for Measuring Multidimensional Poverty. Multidimensional Poverty, why bother? Income is good enough, right? We don't need to worry about education, health, living conditions. None of that is necessary. Well, actually, I think you all agree with me, even if you are hardcore economists, that other aspects of life matter a great deal. In fact, Amartya Sen, who motivated a good deal of this research, has made uh, very important contributions to welfare economics, written much larger. You know, the idea of what does it mean to have uh, a greater well-being. He spent a great deal of time thinking about this, starting with the discussions on inequality and what is it should be, what should be the space in which people are equal, the space that matters. And he came along with the idea of capability approach, which my colleagues might, might talk about. Uh, it illustrates the state of the art quantitative techniques. I want to say for those of you who've taken substantial qualitative analysis courses or if you're in a, a field that's more qualitative, What's interesting here is that we are translating from qualitative information through our approach to measurement into quantitative information that economists know and love in order to you know, prove things about reality or to understand reality or to hopefully motivate policy. It's all being done through this measurement approach that translates from qualitative to quantitative. And it's a unique guide to viewing poverty through the multidimensional lens. I say it's unique because it includes a lot of very recent work, stuff that people at OFI have been doing. So we include a lot of that. And not many other sources include that, even though it's taking, um, it's, how do I say, it's becoming quite popular in many parts of the world as a way of uh, understanding and implementing policy. So this is the table of contents. Isn't this boring for me to present the table of contents? Well, I, let me just riff on it, okay? Imagine I'm a jazz artist. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this and that and this. And I'll get down to the really interesting, really interesting stuff in just a second. Introduction. You know what that's about, right? The idea of why multidimensional poverty and all of the background ideas that led up to this, including a market sense. The framework, which includes axioms and, and also the basic data structure of matrices. We'll see a few of those in just a second. Uh, overview of methods for multidimensional poverty assessment. What's out there? And what is going on? How does this work? Uh, go further. Counting approaches, a specific type of method that's, you know, uh, here's many methods. This is one particular type of method we focus on because it seems to work in particular ways. And it's used a lot over here in Europe and used in uh, Latin America quite a bit. We'll talk about that. Uh, chapter five, the Alcair Foster counting methodology is a specific way of doing accounting methodology, which has caught on because it seems to fit the bill, something that is in between the extremes that others have been working on, but yet it seems to uh, be understandable for people. Then, if you use this approach, you're going to have to make a lot of choices. Multidimensional poverty is about choosing dimensions, choosing cutoffs, choosing uh, values or weights of the various dimensions, etc. Those are normative choices that have to be made in accordance with, well, there are various ways of making normative choices, right? You could have a democratic process make normative choices, or you can have reflective discussion, etc. So this is discussed here, what kinds of normative choices have to be made and how they might be made. Data and analysis discusses the kinds of data you need to implement this technology. Then after you've implemented it, well, how do you know that your measure is going to actually stand up to scrutiny? So robustness exercises, and also your conclusions. Do they stand up to scrutiny? Statistical exercises. Uh, chapter 9, distribution, talking about inequality among the poor, and dynamics. Well, can we discuss chronic poverty in this context? Well, if we have good enough data, yes. So that would require panel data. Can we talk about uh, poverty over time, at least following how poverty changes over time? Sure, of course, that's dynamics in a different sense and that requires cross-section. Uh, finally, if you have your measure, you've constructed it, you know what's going on, and you have the data set, 
which is in the context of a country or a region, and you want to say, well, wait a minute, what is it that uh, is causing this poverty, or what does this poverty, poverty cause? Or perhaps at a household level, what's causing this poverty, what characteristics of a household means that it's going to be multidimensionally poor as opposed to income poor? Great question, son. Huh? This is the, seven, the section where we have some of that uh, covered. All right, so I'm going to now turn it around and ask questions and see where they're going to be discussed. So how can we measure poverty multidimensionally? Well, that's covered in chapter three. There's dashboards where you just have an indicator like the MDGs, one after the other, and you look at this vector and say, oh yeah, we're doing good, well, I think. Okay, uh, composite indices where you weight all of those vectors into a kind of HDI human development index or Venn diagrams like the European Union has used where you have one form of deprivation, another form of deprivation, another form of deprivation, and you see who's in which intersection and who's outside altogether. Uh, dominance, where do you have a situation where someone or the distribution itself is in fact, there's unambiguously less poverty in some sense, or more poverty, or even at an individual level you can view this as well over time. Statistical, fuzzy, axiomatic, and counting approaches are covered in chapter three. Where has the counting approach been used? Well, this is covered in chapter four. It's kind of this historical account. It's a really nice chapter describing the various approaches, including Europe's counting-based measures, including EU 2020, and Latin America's unmet basic needs that has been very popular there, and which is one of the reasons why our approach has seemed to have been able to move in and take over in some sense, parts of Latin America. Um, well, what is this M0 anyway? That's the measure. What does this mean? How do you construct M0, this adjusted headcount ratio? I'll discuss that in just a second. Give me a second, okay? That's in chapter five. Uh, how to choose dimensions, indicators, and so on within M0. Well, hmm. First thing you should do is think about the purpose. If you're gonna measure something, what are you gonna use it for? Is it to monitor? Is it to target? Is it to what? Then you start imagining what kind of data are feasible. Do you have these data available that you think you want to cover, or empowerment data, right? Well, I don't have those data, at least not together with the others that I need to construct a poverty measure that would include empowerment. So you have to address feasibility. And the data might be there, but they might not be good. What does it mean for them not to be good? Uh, ease of communication, this is something many economists miss out on. But it's so important in policy circles. If you can't explain what you're doing, forget about it. You won't have any effect. Uh, so you have to be able to say this variable means this, and by the way, it has good reason to be there, right? So that's the leg legitimacy part. Some of the approaches actually draw from law. The variables come right out of law, the law or the Constitution. Some of them are based on development plans that countries have organized. I mean, there's all sorts of ways of why a variable or a dimension might be considered legitimate. All right, so we'll talk about that in chapter six. What are the different techniques to check the robustness of M0? As I told you, we have to be sure that as we change things a little bit, we aren't really getting totally different results. That would be pretty boring. Again, you're suggesting to the minister, do this, do that, and then, uh, fellow sit in the back of the room says, but if you change this, you get the opposite results. Oops. So there are dominance tests and there's statistics, uh, statistical tests. Sabina will discuss this in just a second. How to conduct dynamic analyses using M0? Well, you have absolute and relative change, significance, dimensional changes, demographics, again, for cross-section or for panel, and S Sabina will talk about that as well. What kind of post-estimation econometric analysis can be done? Well, Paula is the one who will talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, chapter 10 is where the major discussion is located. Macro and micro linear regression models, uh, determinants of poverty at the household level or at the country level. So let's jump right in to the methodology that's behind this book. All right, change gears, matrices. How many of you love matrices? You think about them at night. There in your dreams. <laughs> we have one at least. How many of you look at this and go, ah! <laughs> well, okay. I think I like matrices because they're a compact way of expressing multi-dimensional data. 
here are the persons, here are the dimensions or indicators, or we use different names for them. First one in this example is income in dollars per day for this American example in our original paper. Uh, dollars per day, $13 a day. That's about a little bit above what might be the poverty line in the US. For some people, it's hard because it varies depending on what year, what configuration, etc. But let's suppose it is. Uh, here we have income in dollars per day. Here we have schooling, years of schooling. Okay, So 10 would mean you go to the 10th standard, 10th, 10th grade. 12 would mean you succeed in coming out of high school in the US. Over here is self-reported health. Self-reported health starts with a very low level, poor health, right? And it goes all the way up to excellent health. That's five. So from one to five. This is not meant to be numerically relevant. One to two is not the same as two to three. It's not the same as three to four. Those numbers just stand for better. It's ordinal. It's not a cardinal relevant, cardinally relevant number scale, OK? Uh, this one is a dichotomous variable, zero, one. You either have the social service or not. If you have it, you have a one. If you don't have it, you have a zero. So here are the data points. And we're going to analyze this to see who's poor and how much poverty there is. All right, first off, hit the deprivation cutoffs. These are cutoffs in each dimension that say whether you're deprived or not. So if you have a cutoff of $13 per day, anyone below $13 per day is considered to be deprived. Above or equal is OK. Right? 12 means you have a high school education. By the way, it's justified very nicely through all kinds of empirical results in uh, the US, which show that people who don't have the high school education are so much worse off in terms of health, in terms of jobs, in terms of so many things, that it's a great natural cutoff. You can really justify this. Three means that the lowest two categories are considered to be deprived, so poor and fair health. Uh, one here for the cutoff means that the only one thing that's below is zero, so it means you don't have the social service. That's the idea. So look once again at the table, and magically we have underlines on the deprivations. So a person is deprived. Person two is deprived in dimension two because it's less, seven is less than the 12. Make sense? Everyone getting it? All right, any questions? This is a small group. You can just say, I don't know, I'll get what you're saying. OK. Next, let's turn this matrix here. Put the underlines, each one of those into a 1 for deprived, and 0 for not deprived. So there's the deprivation metrics. You replace the, entry, the entries to make it very simple to represent deprivations that people have. Now, it may be the case that we will want to weight or value the different types of deprivations differently. And it can be done most easily. You just take this matrix and you say, well, uh, apply the weights or values here. And then you would have, say, this being 0.2, this being 0.2, this being 0.2, and this being the residual. OK, that could be what's going on, you see? Now, the weights that we have here right now, I'm taking it in terms of actually adding up to the total numbers of dimensions. So it wouldn't be the percentage weights that I just mentioned. It would be a kind of the take four and re reallocate the four across the four entries. So that's the second way of considering values or weights. We go back and forth in the book in those two approaches, but you get the idea. Once you know there's four, if I tell you it's three and three out of four, you get you force. And so it, it, it works out. So continuing. So let's assume for the sake of the simple, you know, simple example that we have the equal weighted case. That's where you have one, 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 or and fourth, one, fourth, one, whichever way you look at it. Here we're going to just call it one, 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 one. Now, having this uh, deprivation matrix, including weights now, but now we're, we're just having equal weights, how would we consider how, hmm, how deprived a person is? Well, add up. There's the counting approach. You're adding one, two, there's two deprivations. Four deprivations, one deprivation, none. OK, so this column tells you the count of deprivations. Well, who's poor? Just because you're deprived, does that make you poor? No, they're two different things. Our word for poor is a more inclusive thing. That's the overriding feature. Deprivation is a dimensional thing, all right? 
So, huh, well, I don't know. Ah, one approach could be, let's take what we call a union approach, that if you're deprived of any one thing, forget what I just said, if you're deprived of anything, you're considered to be poor. Is that a good option? So first of all, who would be considered poor here? These three. But the problem is the union approach, this approach, often predicts very high numbers. You could see why. In this case, it would be three out of the four who's considered to be poor. Well, let's try another approach. We'll go the other extreme. And there we say you're poor if you are deprived in every single dimension. Who's poor now? You can immediately see there's only one poor person here, and that's that person. But you can also see that it's a very demanding requirement to have every single deprivation, and you could be in really bad shape, and yet somehow miraculously not be deprived in one, and sorry, not prioritized. So this is also a demanding requirement. It is identifying a very narrow slice, typically. So what we have done is we've gone in between the two, intermediate, to some k. Let's say k equals 2. And then we're prioritizing these people, but not this one. This one is not considered to be poor. Only one deprivation. Anyone with two or more is considered to be poor here. So we have two out of the four people here considered to be poor if you take k equals 2. Hmm. Let's go to an example in the real world. If we apply this approach in a particular case, we get a union level of poverty in India during a particular data set here of 91 some odd percent. That's a huge number of people who are poor. It doesn't pass the smell test. It's just too many. And you turn around and say, well, then let's go to the other extreme, and you're down here at the intersection. And it turns out that basically no one in India has all the deprivations in this particular setup. So for this case, with multiple deprivations, you want to choose something in between in order to make sense. That's the idea of this example. All right, so now we know who's poor. How do we aggregate this into an overall measure of poverty? Well, easiest way is, like what I said, uh, let's first of all make sure that we forget about this person. That person is not poor. So I'm going to censor out that person, sort of turn this person into this person, or this person into this person, if you will. So, well, one way or the other. Put zeros down here. We censor out the deprivation of the non-poor. OK, bingo. Now we have it. So, what we've got now, these two poor people and the rest we've censored out. Great. So I think that a good way of thinking about this is in terms of maybe the headcount ratio, the percentage of the population who is poor. Hmm, that might be good. That tells you something. But there is one problem. Suppose that I took this second person here and said, OK, you're now deprived in income, whereas before you weren't. What should happen to poverty axiomatically, if you think that way? What do you think should happen to poverty as a result of a poor person being deprived in an additional dimension? So when you think about this, an axiom is really a little piece of policy. What is it that you think should have happen to your measure to reflect reality so then you can act upon it? <laughs> well, we think that maybe if you raise that person's deprivation from 0 to 1, you now have a deprivation value of 1, that it should be reflected in the poverty measure as a higher value. And indeed, the number of deprivations is up. Hmm. So there's no change with the headcount ratio. Let's reject that measure. Let's get something that's a little more refined, that reflects the intensity of people's deprivations here going from 2 to 3 is more intense poverty. The multiple deprivations is what's behind this approach. And more multiply deprived means, in this case, that you are facing a worse situation. So two persons out of four, no change, violates what we call the axiom is dimensional monotonicity. How can we get that axiom being satisfied? Take into account these numbers. So going back to the example, we have two and four. Hmm, why don't we take a look at the share of each person's deprivations? There's two fourths for the first one, person two, and four fourths for the second one, person three. Hmm, the average deprivation share would be a useful piece of information. How broad are people's, the poor people's deprivation on average? So we define the average deprivation share among the quarter. This, take the average of this and this, and you get three-fourths. Oh, well, I could multiply the headcount ratio by this, much the same way as you multiply h times i in the poverty gap measure, 
That's for people who know the FGT indices. The poverty gap measure is a very similar form. And what happens is that you have the adjusted headcount ratio. It's the product of the headcount ratio, the percentage of the people who are poor, the poverty rate, and the intensity with which people who are poor you know, feel poverty or have poverty or you know, the, the deprivation, uh, average deprivation count. So with this type of measure, we could calculate H, a half, times A, three quarters, is 0.375. For statisticians, though, it's an easier way of calculating things. And in fact, it shows you that the mean is behind everything in the world. Uh, we take this matrix and add up all the entries. Divide by the number of entries. So it's 6 divided by 16. Yeah, that turns out to be what this is. So it is another way of defining this measure. It's the mean of this matrix. And as you know, means have great statistical properties. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with them. And so this is a very helpful definition. Everything makes sense up till now. Okay? Intuition of the measure, it's kind of the average deprivation across society where everyone who's not poor has zero. Okay? So it's the average you know, amount of deprivation or share or average uh, yeah, the, the percentage of deprivations out of the maximum you could have, which would be ones everywhere. So 6 divided by ones everywhere, 16, is what this measure is measuring. So for the rest of this session, um, we're going to, rather than going through a lot of the techniques, take a concrete example and then try to mention where little bits of measurement design and analysis are found. And I start with the fundamental motivation of the book, which is both in chapter one and, and elsewhere, but in a sense, the reason to try to do better multidimensional poverty measurement is clearly not so that it sits in a beautiful library like this only, but also so that it can motivate practical action on the ground. And so it's, it's that link between um, analytical measurement work and the actions it can motivate, which are a central part of uh, different sections of the book. So the example that I'll take initially is the global MPI. This is a measure OP developed together with the UNDP Human Development Report Office. It's been released in 2010 and published in every human development report since. It has three dimensions, the same as the Human Development Index. Those are broad categories. The columns of the matrix are 10 indicators. The weights are equal across dimensions and equal within dimensions, with health and nutrition indicators getting one-sixth of the weight and living standard indicators getting one-eighteenth. But what do they mean? You are deprived if anybody in your household is malnourished. You are deprived if you have lost a child in your household. You are deprived if nobody in your household has completed five years of schooling, or if a child is not attending school up to the age it would complete class eight. You're deprived if you cook with wood, dung, charcoal. If you don't have improved sanitation or if it's shared, you don't have safe drinking water by MDG definitions or have to walk more than 30 minutes to obtain it. If you don't have electricity, if your floor is dirt, sand, or natural. And if you don't own more than one of the following assets, a radio, television, telephone, refrigerator, bicycle, or motorcycle. And if you own a car or a truck, you're not deprived in assets. So these are the indicators, the weights, and the deprivation cutoffs in the global MPI. The purpose of the global MPI was to compare more than 100 countries using existing data. So it was an exercise of drawing on data, fundamentally data constrained. It was always also an exercise out of the UNDP Human Development Report Office, so using the same dimensions as the sister reports, the Human Development Index and the Human Poverty Index. It also wanted to reflect MDG deprivations and so eight of the 10 indicators and cutoffs are related to the MDG standards. And fundamentally, it wanted to be a measure that could be communicated to non-experts, to civil society and activists, as well as uh, those in policy. And so communication was central. So as Tony Atkinson has pointed out, having equality or choosing dimensions so that the weights can be roughly equal, um, and perhaps also equal within those dimensions, makes it easier to explain to people who don't love numbers on a sunny Sunday afternoon. Um, and of course, there would be other ways to design, design measures. This is the National Measure of Colombia. It has five dimensions and 15 indicators. 
Each indicator matches the National Development Plan, and the deprivation cutoff matches the target the government had to reduce deprivations in that indicator. Here's a measure that we built with Maurizio Apoplaza from the EU Silk data set. We did three different measures in this paper with 12 indicators, changing the weights and the um, poverty cutoffs among them, but using the three EU Silk uh, living standard measures of quasi-joblessness, severe material deprivation, and at-risk of poverty, together with other indicators from that survey that are actually less comparable across countries than the global MPI, but it was to illustrate what can be done were the indicators to be more comparable. And there are other ways of choosing and designing measures. So just to give you some examples, these are covered in chapter six. Obviously because we draw on Amartya Sen's work, then the role of public debate is fundamental. In El Salvador, for example, for their national development measure, they've had participatory work for two years to develop the seven dimensions and indicators that reflect poverty among what they call the protagonists of poverty, um, those who experience it and live within it. There's also a need to involve other stakeholders in society, and so many governments in practice have consultations with different actors, civil society, private sector, policymakers in different sectors. And then there are standards. So the government of Mexico, as James mentioned, used the law of social development to frame their measure as income and social rights to identify which rights were important. So there are different documents and processes that can be drawn upon in measurement design. And of course, there are technical issues. I mentioned that you are deprived if one person in your household is malnourished. What that does is it takes information any information we have on malnutrition from any member of the household and identifies every household member as deprived or not based on it. And in this case, if you have a bigger family, there's higher probability that one person will be malnourished. In years of schooling, we do the opposite. You are deprived if any member of your house has completed five years of schooling, following Basu and Foster. If there's one that are person in the household, they read for others and they help. But there is a question of how to translate among units of individuals, data from the household roster, the man's women's questionnaire, and the household itself. Of course, we could take the individual as a unit of analysis, as they do in Mexico, as we do in the EU Silk Measure, or in Bhutan's Gross National Happiness Index, in which case you have to make some decisions about how to translate household achievements to the individuals and the intra-household intra sharing. There are measures with Paola that we've done of redundancy. If the indicators are walking in lockstep, both uh, with very high redundancy and similar changes over time, you may want to get rid of some. Um, and so what are the new tests that are appropriate in this context? And then there are some data issues. For example, you want each indicator to reflect that person or that household's poverty. But if you have time use for the past 24 hours, or a seven day recall period for consumption items, to what extent does that one week or those 24 hours reflect my life? So in chapter 7, we try to get into some of these nitty-gritty details to make respectable measure. And of course, there's the need for us to have the tests. After we've done that, then we'll be able to, for each person or each household, build the row the James, of James's matrix. So build for each of them their row, their deprivation profile, and summits to make their score, and identify them as poor. And so this is also a slide showing how a matrix can be communicated to people who do not dream about matrices in that. Um, and so let me show you. This would be a four-person matrix for the global MPI. These are the health and education indicators with their higher weight. It's a weighted matrix. These are the living standard indicators and the deprivations. These are their weighted sums. And the poverty cutoff is 3.33. So this is actually a censored matrix and we can compute MPI from it, just to link those presentations together. Now, I'd like to pause at this moment, and I may lose some of you, but very briefly mention some of the robustness tests. In any of these choices of parameters, we're on dangerous ground, because how much does health matter in comparison with education? We will disagree. We will disagree with ourselves over time, and we will disagree with each other, and the disagreements may be passionate, depending on the sectors we come from. So Sen suggests that any measure that's put out for the use of public policy should be robust to a range of plausible weights. 
Similarly, the poverty cutoff, just like as for income poverty lines, we have different sensitivity analysis and different ways of assessing robustness. The same needs to be done in the multidimensional context. And also deprivation cutoffs. Is it adequate sanitation of protected pit latrine? Is it flush toilets? Is it adequate water, water from a protected well, or water uh, piped into the house? How sensitive is our me me measure to these choices of parameters? So just to give one example, in a paper with Maria Santos on the original 2010 MPI data, um, we did bootstrapped and analytical standard errors um, to assess the pairwise comparisons. So we drew samples of clusters and we computed MPI for 1,000 uh, simulated samples, 1,000 replications per country. We did the bootstrap as well as the analytical standard errors. And we used very strict comparisons to see if one country was um, more or less poor than another. And we wanted to look at pairwise comparisons. What were we comparing? In one case, we were comparing weights. The MPI has weights of one third, one third, one third. But let's put half on education because we really believe in girls' education. And then a quarter on health and living standards. And let's put a half on health because malnutrition is really where it's at. And then a quarter on living standards and education. And then let's put half on living standards because people's own economic energy can address some other things. And a quarter on the others. So creating those, then you want to know are uh, the ranks or are the comparisons under those different weighting scenarios robust. And similarly with different poverty cutoffs, 20%, 33 uh, 50%. And so in some results, then we were able to um, find uh, the number of pairwise comparisons over different denominators, over all of the possible comparisons, and over those that were robust in the original baseline data. Now that's just, in a sense, computing the MPI, or the M0, the global MPI. But I think where it has gained its policy legs is when it can be unfolded and folded, as our colleague Gaston Jelanecki would say, in different ways. So James mentioned the subgroup decompositions. Um, so obviously an M0 gives a headline measure. You can compare across countries, you can compare over time. But then we might want to know what happens within Cameroon, or within Afghanistan, or within Indonesia. And we now have uh, subnational decompositions for 894 uh, subnational regions and for every country for which we're releasing the global MPI in 10 days' time. But then we want to look at this H and A James talked about. So here we may plot all of the countries in, according to their headcount ratio with Niger, the poorest country, having 89.4% of poor people. But the height is the intensity. It's the average percentage of deprivations poor people experience together. And what you see is that in the poorest countries, each poor person experienced deprivations in a higher proportion of indicators at the same time. So there's a double burden, not only more people, a higher proportion of people, but each person is in some sense poor. It adds information. You can do that nationally, as I just did, but also subnationally. For example, across the states of India, or Pakistan, Nepal. And then there's a second property James mentioned of dimensional breakdown. For the policymaker, fine, I know we're the poorest, but what should we do? And that comes back to the action on the indicators and how that can be used. So in the case of Cameroon, these are the percentage of people who are poor and are deprived in each indicator. You take James's censored matrix, and then you take the columns vertically of zeros and ones, and you take the mean. And that's the censored headcount ratio. So deprivations are highest. 45% of people in Cameroon are poor and deprived in cooking fuel. And nearly 30% have lost a child. And you can do that nationally, but you can also do that subnationally. You also might want to look at the weights because the health and education indicators have higher weights and say, well, how much, which indicator contributes most to poverty? In these, the yellow are education, the red are health, and the green are living standards. And you can see that across the regions of Cameroon, and this is important if you are the governor of this particular province, they vary quite a bit. And so this gives, again, a, a bit of purchase for action. Um, at subnational levels or other, other social group levels. So far, I've just been illustrating results for one period. But of course, all of this can be done in a dynamic context, either with repeated cross-section data or with panel data. 
So to share just a little bit uh, using repeated cross sections, this is in a paper with Schumann Schett, um, uh, that uses NFHS two and three rounds. Um, and we did something very similar to the global MPI, but we made har a strict harmonization so that we could do comparisons across time. And first of all, at the global level, multidimensional poverty went down from 1990 to 2006, and it was st significant. Similarly, H and A went down statistically significantly. <coughs> Indeed, if we look at the absolute annualized reduction in MPI, it was larger than the annualized reduction in income poverty um, of, between 1994 and 2004 5. Of course, one can assess the dominance not just for the poverty cutoff we used, which was 33.33%, but also for other poverty cutoffs. And the change in poverty um, was also significant for many of those cutoffs. And then we may want to go subnationally, so break it down by state. And here we see that the state that had the biggest reduction was Andhra Pradesh, and the next biggest was Kerala. But Kerala is not very poor. And the one with the least reduction, in fact it was not significant, is Bihar. We will combine Bihar and Jharkhand because of the period, which was the poorest state. So not an entirely happy picture. Um, we can also compare the reduction in MPI with the reduction in the income, the headcount ratio. So MPI headcount ratio and income headcount ratio we're comparing using the government figures um, from the 2009 reports, but from 2004-5. And here we see an interesting pattern. This is the change in monetary poverty. So very little, very fast change, change in multidimensional poverty. Um, and this is the starting headcount ratio. So these are the poorest. And what you see is that in income, it was very good. Be sorry, here. It, it, because the poorest regions reduced income poverty the most. But in multidimensional poverty, we see a different pattern. The poorest regions, the poorest states, reduced multidimensional poverty the least. So there's certainly a value in, in bringing a different kind of poverty to stage and seeing how the trends have occurred. The line is a regression line fitting. And of course, this was for states, but we can also do it for social groups, Muslims, Hindu, Christian, Sikh, or the tribes and rural urban areas. And there also we may want to know, in a sense, whether headcount ratio, getting people out of poverty, was really driving the change or reducing the poverty of people who remain poor, that is reducing intensity. And we see different varieties, Andhra Pradesh reduced intensity a great deal. Kerala basically pushed people out of poverty. So learning these dynamic patterns is quite interesting. And then of course we'll want to look at how that was done. Reduction in sanitation was the greatest, but there was significant reduction in all 10 of the censored headcount ratios um, over time, both in absolute terms. And then there are also real, um, relative figures listed there. And, but the patterns vary a great deal by state. Kerala obviously had very low original education deprivations, and those didn't change. But it had very strong reductions in the living standard indicators. Andhra had reductions all the way across. So that's, in a sense, showing you the configuration of different kinds of partial and sub-indices. Um, both in one period of time and over time. And I should just mention in closing that we also have, as I mentioned with the EU Silk data set, individual levels of analysis in which we can break them down by gender. And for example, see that in all of the European countries, women were poorer than men, and many of them significantly poorer. Um, so I will simply mention that this work is academic, but there are also national governments that are releasing um, MPIs, for example, in Chile, they have an income poverty measure and a multidimensional poverty measure, and they launched that in February. Um, and also, with the sustainable development countries' uh, goals on the horizon, there is interest in an MPI both for developing countries, but then also in other contexts. In this couple of minutes that we still have left, we're finishing this presentation. Um, I would like to introduce you to chapter 10, chapter 10, which is called Sum Regression Models for the AF Method. The purpose of the chapter is to be an introductory chapter of the types of regression models that you may be interested in studying. So this isn't a comprehensive chapter. 
the question that came up to us as the motivation question was essentially, what are we missing? Sabina has presented you a series of analysis that one can perform once we measure poverty with M0 and its partial indices. You can decompose, you can look at the indicator contributions, you can do analysis over time. All these add value to policy, but all this remains descriptive. So in this uh, simple example, which is an analysis of a data set with my colleague Mauricio, we have uh, computed the M0 value for Indonesia. I don't know, at that moment, we did all these decompositions, but at the same time, we were interested in assessing what were the role of these different characteristics in a multivariate framework. So clearly, despite it being descriptive and providing a lot of information, it is still not complete. So for us, it is vital not only to compute our measures, to measure poverty itself, but at the same time to try to assess the transmission mechanisms between poverty and policies. But how can we do that? Clearly, the framework would be to use regressions. In this chapter, the types of regressions we present comprise two groups. One is what's called microregression, and the other is what's called macroregression. Clearly, we're building on economics, and we're also building on the tradition of monetary poverty regressions. When we say micro, we refer to unit of analysis where the household or the person is the main interest and macroregressions refer to unit of analysis for some spatial aggregate that could be a socioeconomic group, it could also be a province, it could also be a region. The framework that we provide in this chapter falls within a class of regressions, which is referred to as the generalized linear models. How, how familiar are you with this terminology? Very much familiar. Yeah? This GLM is essentially an extension of standard linear regression in which we allow the dependent variables to be of different nature, could be non-continuous, clearly discrete in the case of the EF measures, these are indices or fractions or proportions, but we can also allow for non-normality. So that is the reason why we present this technique in the book. But clearly it's not the only one, but it is an umbrella technique where many different models could be specified. So that's the powerfulness of the technique. In these macro regressions, some interesting policy questions that one may like to study would be, at the micro side, determinants of poverty at a household level. May they create poverty profiles? In the case of macro regressions, well, why not try to assess the elasticity of poverty to economic growth while controlling for other determinants? Or maybe understand how macro variables, like, for example, infrastructure density or information technology or public expenditure, relate to multidimensional poverty levels and changes, but also changes over time and changes across groups. So some focal variables that we may be interested in studying here, it's a very simple way to represent an um, regression framework. We have, for example, a binary regression variable where we will compare the deprivation score that Sabina has presented with the poverty threshold. Clearly, for all those households, with this condition is satisfied, we will have a one and a zero otherwise. In this case, the range of the dependent variable would be a zero one. It would be a probability model at the micro level. And the condition and distribution of this data generation process would be a Bernoulli distribution. For an aggregate value like M0 or H, we may have an index, which is essentially a proportion. At the macro level, it would be maybe um, indices at maybe for provinces or maybe for socioeconomic groups. And in this case, this conditional distribution would be a repetitive Bernoulli process. This is the binomial distribution. So these are the two types of models that are illustrated in the chapter. But as I said, they are not the only models that one may consider. One may be interested in taking the deprivation score as itself without dichotomizing. In that case, maybe it would be a Poisson process because we are counting the deprivations and it would be truncated because we have a metadata. So it's a different model that you may be interested in exploring. Well, the generalized linear modeling framework is essentially a, mo a type of uh, model where we are interested in predicting a function of the conditional mean of the dependent variable as a function of the linear combination of explanatory variables. In the GLM framework, there are two types of things that one must remember. One is the linear predictor, which clearly is obtained through this link function. This link function is the, the, the function of the conditional expectation that leads us to a linear form. Within the GLM 
linear regression is a specific case where the link function is the identity function. So for the previous models I have shown, the link functions would be either the product or the norm. Here it comes. So in this table, just to complete the preceding explanation, we have the link function as a logical product, and then the mean function, which is the main interest of the analysis. So for this binary model, very simple. Clearly, the conditional probability would be, in this case, the conditional expectation. And this is simplified. And the, uh, the Bernoulli distribution would be the random component of the GLM. A difference from linear regression, where we can specify the distribution of the dependent variable through the disturbance, in the GLM, we need to specify the randomness directly by modeling the distribution of the dependent variable itself. So in here, it would be the random map. So for the probit link or the logic link, depending on which one is of main interest, and clearly there is a relationship between both, but the logic has more intuitive interpretation, we may end up having this kind of model, which would be the logic or the log of the odds of this probability, which will give us the relative chances of being more dimensionally important. So for ex this example, taking again data from Indonesia, we have regressed the log of the odds of being more dimensionally poor for a cutoff of 33% on demographics, socioeconomic characteristics of the household head. Clearly, at this point, we have selected some explanatory variables that we have considered not to be uh, correlated, highly correlated with the dependent variable itself. Otherwise, we would be facing an endogeneity issue, which would be, I think, an issue that most of you would be dealing with whenever you are doing your models. At that moment, we would need to find a comprehensive to that. So the results here tell us, for example, that the probability to be multidimensionally poor decreases with the years of decay of the household head and increases with the um, gender of the household head being a female. So here the odds ratio provides additional information on this type of comparisons that we could do. In addition, we could have the logistic regression, which is the standard, where we can see the predicted probability and how this varies with the years of decay of the household head, let's say by rural urban population. So just to complete our step word on macro regressions, here we need to take into account the bounded nature of these two indices, which are essentially comprised between zero and one. And for that, we need to consider that these are fractional variables. So we have decided to follow the approach proposed by Papke and Woodridge in 1996, where they proposed to use a quasi-likelihood method, which is a standard likelihood but with the additional assumption that if the conditional expectation is properly specified, even if we miss in the type of distributional assumptions of the dependent variable, the estimators will still be consistent. So in this case, the Bernoulli really load like the function is the one that they propose for this kind of functions. So the way forward is to simply to encourage you to perform different models whenever this would be of your interest and consider different types of specifications not simply the ones that we have talked about today. Thank you very much.